The Man with the Wen In Europe, this tale is known as the presence of the little folk, as collected by the Brothers Grimm in Germany, and it most usually features two hunchbacks. It is quite widely distributed in France and Italy, and Turkish and other versions are also known. The following presentation is interesting because it is found in a collection of tales of Japan dated 1664, and believed to date from a much earlier time there. The behaviour of the goblins, with their piping and dancing and tricks, seems very close to that of the Irish little folk. Indeed, a similar fiction is found in Ireland, where it is known as the legend of Knockgrafton. Supporters of the migration theory have suggested that it dates from times when a Turanian tribe occupied Ireland, even before the Celts, though such a supposition is not essential to explain its diffusion. Once, long ago, in old Japan, there was a man who spent his days trudging up and down the mountains collecting wood. This he used to burn and to make charcoal, for he was unable to make a living in any other way. This unfortunate fellow thought that the gods were in some way displeased with him, for he had on his left cheek a large and disfiguring swelling, what people call a wen. He had gone to many doctors, but whatever treatment they had prescribed had never been of any use. In fact, whatever medicine he tried, the wen grew larger and larger day by day. He was so distressed at his appearance that he shunned other people and gradually became more and more miserable. His wife tried to be cheerful about the matter and pretended to be unaware of it, the wen and the depression into which her husband was falling. However, in the end it made her hate him. Their life as charcoal burners was not one of much happiness, and for all the wood he could gather, there seemed to be very little financial gain. The poor woman was seriously thinking of running away, back to her own village, and leaving him and his monstrous wen forever. One day, with an uncomfortable bundle of wood on his back in an osier basket, the charcoal burner went slowly up the mountain track, fingering his wen with exploring fingers, positive that it was larger than the day before. Suddenly the thunder rolled, the lightning flashed, and heavy, slanting rain began to fall. Oh, merciful heaven, he cried, so far from home and so little wood, and now this downpour, where can I shelter? Stumbling and falling, half blinded, he was at the end of his strength when his hands touched the bark of a hollow tree. Gratefully, he eased the basket off his thin shoulders and covered the top with his wide hat. He saw that there was enough space for him to creep into the hollow of the ancient tree trunk. There was scarcely a drop of rain on his head and shoulders as he crouched there, and he pulled his thin coat around him, removing his sandals to rest his aching feet. The thunder rolled, and it seemed as if the world was about to crack into millions of pieces. But as quickly as it had begun, the storm ceased. The charcoal burner fingered his wen, and was just about to creep out of the tree when he heard the tramp of feet. The rays of the setting sun played on a group of people who came marching along the mountain path, lighting them with a crimson glow. Whoever can they be? wondered the man, quickly retrieving his sandals and slipping his feet into them. He still remained inside the tree hollow, for the sound of wild piping came to his ears. With staring eyes he gazed at a multitude of creatures. They were the strangest he had ever seen in his life. There must have been about a hundred of them, a troop of what he now realized were some sort of enchanted beings. They were all of strange shapes. Some were tall, covered with creepers, hung with curious beads. Others were small and shrunken like skeletons with phosphorus eyes, dancing disjointedly, yet with a gay abandon. Some had the mouths of crocodiles, snapping like castanets, 
keeping in time to the sound of drums almost martial in their rhythms. There were elves with one eye in the middle of their foreheads, dwarves with tremendous feet, all stamping and leaping along the mountain path in perfect time with the shrill piping and drumming. There were pale witches with long black hair and huge dark giants dressed in bearskins. Those who did not have musical instruments had magic wands in their hands or claws or paws, but each was leaping and pirouetting in joy and excitement. Some had two horns, some had only one, but each contributed noisily to the general merriment and air of carnival. Not daring to show himself, the frightened charcoal burner peeped through a knothole and held his breath. They came to a stop just near his hiding place, and the stamping and music grew louder. They made a large circle, ambling or hopping, round and round, with one of their number in the middle, the head demon evidently, jumping as high as the other's heads in a series of extraordinary leaps. They lit a huge bonfire, and holding up torches which they ignited there, shouted and sang at the top of their voices. The firelight gleamed on furry legs, shining tusks, or flashing eyes. As he watched and heard the music, the charcoal burner became as gay as they. Forgotten was his when and his predicament. He leaped into the firelight, and his feet carried him round in a most lively dance. His when bobbed about, but he did not even try to cover it as usual with one hand. His arms were flung into the air, and he danced crazily, willing and fey, with all the others enjoying themselves around the fire. Well done! Excellent timing! shouted the head demon. Keep it up, human being. We are much entertained. Each demon roared or screeched encouragement. The man danced like one whose very life depended on his feet not touching the ground for more than a split second. The lesser demons piled more wood on the flames, others carried torches round and round. The laughter and screeching grew in intensity, and so did the intricate dancing of all present. The charcoal burner managed to hold his own in that mighty throng. He laughed as he had not done since the night of his wedding so many years ago, when he felt himself to be the happiest and most favoured man of the village where he was born. At last, completely worn out, he came to a sudden stop and felt terribly thirsty. As if he had read the charcoal burner's mind, the head demon handed him a bowl of wine. The flavour was amazingly good, and it slipped down his throat like a priceless elixir. He felt as good as ever within a few seconds of having drunk and felt the gleaming eyes of the head demon upon him. You have danced well said the demon with sincerity. We have been immensely privileged to have you in our little company. Never have we seen a human who could keep up with our ideas of revelry, let alone surpass us. No, no, said the charcoal burner politely. It was most remarkably good of you to allow my faltering steps to... Faltering steps? You are a master of the dance, roared the demon pressing the wine bowl upon the man once more. I speak for all of my people when I say we have tonight, in fact, learnt much in the way of steps from you. You must come tomorrow night and teach us more. Very flattered by the important demon's attentions, the human being could scarcely believe his ears. Tomorrow night? Oh, noble entity! I would like nothing better in this world. Just let me recover my strength, and I will, with all my heart, attend your revels here, for I am most amazed by your frivolity, he answered gallantly. Just a moment, though, said the head demon, as his minions refilled his wine bowl and lavished every attention on him. Human beings sometimes find life so demanding that they forget our invitations. Let us see what sort of a pledge you can leave with us, so that we can be sure that you will come back. A few of the demons held a consultation, and when they had made a decision, they came to the head demon and said, 
Lord Deven, we have democratically decided that, as some humans consider a wen to be a very fortunate thing to have, we will ask the man to leave that as a sign of his good faith. Done, said the head demon. With your permission, good sir, of course, just a small prick. The charcoal burner's finger went up to his cheek in his usual gesture of dismay. He felt a minute twinge, as if a gnat had stung him, and at that moment the entire devilish company vanished. And with them, his wen had also disappeared. He could not believe his good fortune. The moon was now up, all signs of the fire the demons had lit and danced around had gone. He slipped his osier basket onto his back, loaded with the wood he had collected, and made his way home with his mind in a turmoil. His wife was delighted to see him without the monstrous wen. Her heart was uplifted, and she decided not to run away after all. Life would now be much better with the hideous lump removed from her husband's face. He told her everything from start to finish, and her eyes were like a fawn's in the lamplight. All the love she had had for him on their wedding day returned. But more was to come. In the bottom of his osier basket, when the wood was all taken out and stacked in the hut, were a hundred pieces of finest silver money. Husband! Husband! You will never have to work again collecting wood. We can enter some other nice clean business. Let us give thanks to the gods for what they have caused to happen tonight, cried the woman in the height of excitement. Now, next morning, the tale was told all round the charcoal burner's circle of friends. One neighbour, a baker, said, Oh, dear brother, l let me go in your place, please, so that I could have this wen removed from my cheek, for it has plagued me greatly since it appeared a few months ago. If only I could go and meet those demons, the dancing would be quite easy to do, I'm sure, and I certainly could do with a hundred pieces of finest silver to get myself a new oven. His wife added her screams and tears to his request. So the kindly charcoal burner told the baker where to go, and the neighbor set off gaily up the mountain track. He reached the hollow tree and settled down for a long wait, eating some salted fish and bread while he looked forward to the devilish train's arrival. He had a large osier basket with him, in which he hoped to take his silver home. No sooner had the sun disappeared than he heard the tramp of the approaching throng. Pipes, flutes and drums grew louder and louder. Singing and shouting, the demons came, as before, into the clearing. Their heads tossed, their eyes and teeth gleamed in the starlight. The festivities began, the fire was lit, and the demons started dancing. Soon the whole mountainside was reverberating with sound. Has the man not come as he promised he would? Some of the demons began to ask each other. Here I am, just as I agreed, shouted the baker, running towards them. He took out his fan, and covering his wen, began to dance and sing as hard as he possibly could. But his feet were not as nimble as that of the charcoal burner, and he had no natural rhythm at all. He just seemed to shuffle and hop, with no more grace than a goat. The demons looked on with distaste, and several gave him the thumbs-down sign. The head demon snarled with rage as the man cavorted clumsily round the fire. Your feet are like lead, nothing like last night's performance, he roared and the others screeched insults, spitting at the baker like wildcats. This won't do. We are not at all amused by this behavior. Where is your heart tonight? Here, take your pledge and go. Leave us this instant. Thunder rolled, lightning flashed, rain fell. The roaring and offensive remarks hurled at him so terrified the baker that he ran for his life, a wen on either cheek.